Well, I have the pleasure of introducing the soon-to-be Dean of Extended Learning at Cochise College, um, George Self. George is going to be talking to us today about creating a presence with Moodle. And I'm really hoping that some of you have gone to his iMoot course and um, gone through to the link to his demonstration course and had a look at the, the different versions of, um, of one class. I know when I work with staff um, at our university here in, in New Zealand, there are a lot of version ones, a lot of them. So um, I might just have to be taking lots of notes and making sure that when this video gets to YouTube, I broadcast it to all of them. <laughs> so without further ado, I will hand over to George. Thanks, George. Thank you, Teresa. Well, let's get started. As Teresa mentioned, I do have a website to show you in just a few moments. Uh, this class, of course, concerns how to create a presence in an online class. Uh, let me start with a bit of an introduction and challenge you to think about going to a face-to-face -face college class. You walk into a classroom and, and at the appointed hour the professor walks in, simply walks to the front of the room, writes a few things on, a, on the whiteboard there, turns around and says, for next week, read chapter three, have the uh, discussion questions at the end of the chapter typed up, and I'll see you next week. And then he turns around and disappears for a week. You would likely think that that professor has shortchanged you on your education, and you would be right. And yet, far too many times, we have classes that are exactly like that, that our students are having to endure uh, in Moodle. What I wanted to do, what I have done, is created a Moodle presence. Oh, let me bring that up on the whiteboard here, uh, or on our screen share. <laughs> yeah, that professor is a snooze fest. Although sometimes college students, uh, when they have those 8 o'clock in the morning classes, prefer to have a snooze fest, frankly, I'm thinking. At any rate, as we go through today's lecture and the, and the slides, uh, the presentation, from time to time I'm going to say, if you want to increase your presence in the class or in the Moodle uh, space, you would do this. And we'll come back to this class that I've built here. Now this is a private Moodle server that, that I run myself. Now, there's nothing special about it. It's just a plain vanilla Moodle instance. But what you'll notice is that what I have done is create several versions of this one session. And you can see the session right now has nothing in it except a posted syllabus. Here's a presentation for week one. Uh, it's a, a, a little PowerPoint slideshow and then a quiz over the syllabus. And far too often, the instructors at my college will create 10 or 15 sessions that look something like this and say, well, I've got my class ready. And it's sometimes difficult for me to tell them, you know, your class really isn't ready yet. So this would be my version of a bad class. The only thing in here are assignments, maybe a couple of quizzes. Uh, there may be a forum or two. And it's that way week after week after week. And our students do deserve better. So to improve your presence in the classroom, the sense that the professor is actually there teaching students and they, they haven't just been put on robo uh, instructor of some sort, there are two phases that I want to consider today. First is preparing your class long before the students show up. And the second phase is what you're actually doing while the students are present with you in class, the conduct phase. Oh, and Teresa, you're right. Some think it is great. Well, we've got that forum out there. By goodness, there's a lot of good interaction. Well, all right. And quite honestly, some of my instructors don't even check the forum. They think that as long as the students are talking to each other, that's really all that matters. Oh, it's a mess. And before anyone thinks it, I don't think our instructors at my school are any worse than anyone else's. You can find those folks everywhere. All right. At any rate, the first phase, preparation phase. 
The first thing I like to tell my professors is become a human to your students, not just a name on the screen. Actually have something about yourself that is human. And I tell them to start with the profile in Moodle. Include a photograph in the profile. And I encourage my professors to make their photograph or what I like to call professorial, something that looks like a professor. We had, I'm, I'm checking the, the chat room here too. Oh yeah, Moodle is just a great book. We have some of those folks too. Um, <laughs> very interesting. At any rate, include a photo of yourself. I had a professor one year put a photograph of herself in there where she was uh, seated in a garden, very relaxed, had on a pair of flip-flops and, and, and a house dress of some sort, uh, sipping a, a glass of wine. And this was her way of letting students know that she was teaching the class. I guess there's nothing really wrong with that. But I like to have my professors look a little more like a professor that students are going to want to listen to, something a little more professorial. professorial. I also tell them in their profile, please qualify yourself to teach the class. Tell students a little bit about your background, what it is you do, why you feel like you are uh, uh, qualified to teach that class. And I also encourage my professors to include just a bit of personal information about themselves or oh, a hobby or something. When they read my profile, they'll read that I have a couple of Cocker Spaniel dogs at my house. It doesn't, it isn't much, but it makes me look a bit more human to them than simply a name on the screen. I also encourage uh, instructors, add a video of yourself, uh, just a short video where you're saying, hi, welcome to class, and I'm glad to have you here. Oh, next, let me bring back my, there we go. And I'm going to jump now to version two of my class. Again, this one introduction. And at this point, you can see I've now added some of my own language, some of my own introduction here. So at the start of the session, here's a little bit of a note about what the students can expect during this session. My syllabus is still there. The presentation is still there, but now I've added some verbiage so the students know what is actually expected of them without having to click on a bunch of links and open stuff up. It's right here on the main course page, and the little syllabus is here. So during our, during our uh, preparation phase, the next thing we're going to do is create a personal written introduction for the session and include some information from your discipline that will update the book. Up here in this introduction, I might include some things that, that's happening right now in my, in my discipline. Here's some latest news, so that the students don't think all you've done is just copy and paste something from a publisher's website. And I'm pausing just a moment. Um, some teachers call that progress. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I have a question here. Do you worry about the TLDR mindset in students with version 2? I'm sorry. I'm not understanding the question. Oh, and that's a very good point. Uh, and I like that abbreviation, too long, don't read. Uh, wall of text. Uh, I like to call it the scroll of death. Very often what I will do is I will put my, my classes in a, um, a format, a folder, a folder format, so that they only get one session at a time that's visible, and they actually have to click to get to the next session. Uh, by doing this, we don't get such a long scroll of death, and I think it's a little less uh, onerous for the student. They'll, they'll get to the site, and if all they see is this much, it really isn't that bad. And eventually we're going to even doctor this up and make it look a little prettier for students. Um, so I don't think it's that bad. My version of Moodle, I, I just built this site a couple of weeks ago, so it's got to be 2. Dot, I'm going to have to guess 5. Um, 
it's a very recent version of Moodle. So if you're at a, an institution that's still back at 1.9, you may or may not have some of these features. Um, and Richard, you may be right. I could take a moment and check, but uh, whatever it was I built just uh, a, a few weeks ago. Now, see, that's not being a good instructor, a good presenter. I should have anticipated all of those questions and had the answer at my fingertips. Oh, well, you'll have to just beat up on me later. Okay, so next, we're going to create a personal written introduction for each session. And at the point now is we're beginning to make our professors look a little more human. They have a, have a better presence in the class. That They are now actually communicating with the student. Next, aesthetics. We want to make the class more aesthetically pleasant for the students. So we'll add things like images and, and interesting pull quotes. So let me move on down now to version three of my session. Same version or same session, uh, same information in there, but notice I've just added this little Wordle um, uh, image. You know, it isn't much. But now we've added a little bit of interest to our class. Now, if I were teaching a class oh, in art, I could certainly add some image of, of a famous art piece here. If I were teaching a science class, I might add an image of oh, an eyeball or whatever it is we're studying. As it happens, this particular class is about uh, presenting information online. It's a technical presentation class. That's a little bit abstract, and about the best I could come up with was a little Wordle image, but it works just fine. It makes the page look a little more present. It lets the students know that the professor's actually been in the class and done something other than just say, here's the lesson, read it. So that would be the next tip for me. Next. We can add some live lectures. I'm a great believer in video. I'm a great believer in creating video uh, for my students, introdu introducing each section for the students. Even if my introduction isn't much more than five or six minutes, and I'll tell you, I tell my instructors, please don't create a 30-minute video. Your students don't want to watch that. But a five or a six minute video to introduce the topic, and if the topic's really important that I need a long video, I break it up into two or three sections. Oh, for example, one of the classes that I teach is Perl programming. And I've created a series of videos each week in that class. Each video is only about four or five minutes long. It introduces one Perl concept. And the students then can watch whatever videos they think are important to them, uh, the things that confused them in the book. And if they don't want to watch it, well, that's all right, too. So I do live lectures. I do uh, a head and shoulders type of video introduction. I have screencasts. I post podcasts out there for my class and narrated PowerPoint slideshows. These are all ideas that might help you with your class. Let's go to the next section here, the version four of this same video. And you'll notice now that I've got my video right here in the middle of the, of the screen. The student only has to click on it and start it up and watch me give an introduction. I have a question here. Uh, how many sections do you have? Most classes at my college run a 16-week uh, format, and so I do 16 sections, one for each week. Uh, today I don't have that many. Of course, I only have about seven versions, I think, of this. But typically my classes are 16 sections long. Okay. Oh, Randall, I will tell you there's a version, uh, there's a, a format for Moodle that gets you the navigation uh, buttons uh, forward and back, and I forget what that particular format is called, maybe the folder view or something. You might want to take a look at some of the different views available. Uh, some of them give you the forward and back uh, buttons, and some of them give you the jump menu at the bottom of the page. Um, let me see. 
Well, Richard, there you have it, yes. Some of our professors are also stuck. Some of our professors want me to take a video camera into their lecture hall and videotape their lecture while they're writing on the whiteboard because that's really good technology and create a 60-minute video, post that puppy out there someplace, but not on YouTube because we don't want somebody who's not a student to accidentally see what the professor's teaching. And uh, and then let the students watch that as their illustrated lecture. It's really hard sometimes for me to work with instructors and try to convince them that a five-minute uh, video is more than adequate. Anyway, I digress. Oh, Randy, thank you. The, the jump pull-down was added in version 2.5. So there you have it. Um, and there's some more information. Excellent. So we're using collaborate and post that in her, as a, yeah, Rand have been there. <laughs> I know the feeling. Okay, the next thing I'll add is a personalized syllabus. Again, I'm in the preparation phase, and I'm going to take my syllabus and personalize it just a little bit. Now, I know that all of us, I shouldn't say all of us, a lot of us have universities that will say, here's the syllabus template. You have to use it. Just fill in the blanks and give this to your students. And that's fine. I know some attorney has told them, we want to make sure all of these things are in there or we could get sued. And I understand that. I honor that. There are things we have to be careful of. But there's no reason why in a syllabus that you can't have things like your own picture out there or a little pull quote, something like this, so that I can draw attention to what I think is important in the syllabus. I'll add a little image of some sort. And so even though this syllabus does follow our, our institution's um, uh, template, and all of the pieces are there. I have added a little bit to make the syllabus a little more personalized for me. And I think the students appreciate it. Again, it makes me seem more human to the students than just a name on the screen. And I'm catching up here on the uh, discussion board. Um, it's often less understandable. That's perfect. And I will tell you one thing I like about recorded lecture and video lecture. Uh, I've done a lot of the, um, what do I want to say, tutorials at places like lynda.com where I've learned a great deal from a recorded video lecture. And I figure if I can learn that way, maybe it's a good way for my students to also learn. Um, and you get tabs at the top end links, one topic format plugin. There we go. You guys are teaching the class better than me. Go go for it. Help me out. Okay, so next step was a personalized syllabus, and I'm going to include my own ideas and template uh, to, to add to the college's template. Uh, next, course organization. I like organizing the class so the students kind of sort of know various sections in each each uh, week. And again, let me pull up my sample uh, class here. I'm going to move to the next version of this same section. And again, you can see I've got a little bit of, of eye candy here, some interest. I've got the video. But now notice I've broken up the bottom part of this class with resources and work to do. I've added some nice icons here. I've divided all of my material into two parts so students now real quickly see what are resources and what is work that's going to be due this week. And so this, again, is a way for me to help organize a class for the students. But more than that, it makes the instructor present in the class. This is exactly the kind of thing I would do in a face-to-face -face class. I would organize the class so that at first, we're going to talk about the resources. We're going to talk about things. I'll put stuff on the whiteboard, show them PowerPoint slides, whatever I'm going to do. But at some point, then I break the students into small groups or, or something, and I make them work on something themselves so that they are actually doing work during the class. And I'm going to organize my online class in exactly the same way. This, again, gives the, the students my presence in the classroom. 
and again, I'm just catching up on the chat board here. <laughs> Richard, if the sun has not risen there, I can tell you here in Arizona, it's been up a long time, and we're pretty hot outside. I'll be glad to send you some of my sunshine a little later today. All right, course organization, oh, and due dates. I want to go back and show you. I'm very careful to actually post the due date with the title of the assignment. I have a lot of professors who think it's adequate to stick the due dates in the syllabus. So every week the student has to open up the syllabus, get that document open on the screen, scroll down to the bottom of the syllabus where we've got the calendar posted, and figure out what's due this week. And I like to tell those professors, look, this is rubbish. You've got this great tool here. Your, your class is already organized by sessions, so we know session number five is, you know, during May 5th or whatever it is. So go the extra step and actually put the due dates here with the title of the presentation so students know immediately when everything is due. There's never any question. Here's my uh, syllabus quiz. We know exactly when this puppy is due. <laughs> Great. Um, and Rich, you're right. These are long. These are long descriptions, and they could be shortened up. I take that absolutely as a as a solid comment. Well, back to my PowerPoint slides now. Like a good professor, I never get too far away from PowerPoint. The next thing I'm going to do during preparation phase is use a choice or feedback activity to elicit feedback from students. Some of you may know that some of your instructors really don't want to know what students think about the class. I have some like that. But I like knowing what students have to think. So during my sessions, oh, let me open up the next version of my class here. During my sessions, I always try to include a quick check. This is uh, the uh, uh, a choice item or maybe a feedback item in Moodle. It's a very simple kind of thing. Basically, it's just, what did you understand this week? What is still not clear to you? Uh, how can I improve the class? And I read those comments from the students, and, and I really take them to heart. And if some student says, gosh, I don't like that you have so many words posted at the, after each uh, uh, topic, well, I'll consider that. I may go in then for future sessions and cut some of that down. I really try to focus my class on what the students need, how they guide me. And uh, I, I really appreciate doing that. And I think the students appreciate it. It gives the students, again, a sense that the professor is actually present. Now, of course, we have to temper that. I'm not going to go chasing down every time a student makes a comment. I'm going to make some major change to the class. Of course, I'm not doing that. But doggone it, if two or three students are saying the same thing, maybe it's time for me to take a look at the class and see if there's anything I can do to improve the presentation. Uh, Richard, I, I know it's never criticism. These are observations, and I deeply appreciate any observation any student ever makes, whether it's a, a class that I'm teaching at Cochise College or it's a session I'm doing here for iMoot. Oh, let's see. And it's productive for everyone. And again, I think it gives the stu a feedback, gives the students a sense that the professor is actually there paying attention and is trying to help make the class better. So back to PowerPoint. Next, I want to take a look at the conduct phase of the class. So this is where the class is actually in session. And the things I'll do during the classroom uh, session to make my presence known. First, weekly updates. I'll post an update every week to students, either in a news form, because all of the students get that, or I'll use an email message uh, to my students. Now, I will tell you, before the session ever begins, before my class begins, I already have pre canned email messages. Folks like many of you, I've taught a, a particular, um, I've taught a, uh, Rich, thank you. Uh, they're not substitute notes. I will tell you, the PowerPoint slides that I've posted on the iMoot site, I actually have notes pages with each slide, so you get a chance to see all of the stuff that I'm saying in note form. 
So they are, in fact, substitute notes if you'll download the ones from the iMoot site. I'm kind of anal that way. At any rate, weekly updates. I've taught my classes for so many years, I really kind of know where students are going to run into problems. And so I've taken the time to create, and this is a Word document that I've posted up here now. I've actually created pre-canned, ready-to-go email messages. So here at March 24th, and I go in every semester and update the date, so I know on March 24th, here's the message that I'm going to send to my students. Now certainly from semester to semester, I'll adjust this message. Something may have happened in class last week that I'll, I will mention here. I may lengthen this, I may shorten it, whatever it is. But at least I know I have the beginning of an email message that I can send to my students. And I've used it for years. I already know that it's going to address the questions that students have asked over the past several semesters. And so every week, my students know that they can expect to get an update email from me. It's going to prepare them for the upcoming work. And it's also going to address things that may have happened in the previous work. I'll also sometimes post a link in this email to some news article that just hit the news over the past two or three weeks. And I'll let the students know, gosh, here's a great link. Here's a great website. You may want to go out and take a look at it. This news article is all about you know, whatever it is we're talking about. And so I do try to uh, do weekly updates with my students. Again, it's increasing the sense of presence. I am there with the students every week. Um. <laughs> Well, thank you very much uh, about my dungeon masterness, if that's a real word. Conduct phase. Next, hidden form so it's easy to copy and paste. Uh, Stuart, I will tell you, that's a great idea. I've done a similar thing, but I've used hidden um, uh, what is it, uh, labels. It's exactly the same concept. I'll stick a message in a label. Uh, in fact, here's another tip. We, uh, I encourage my instructors to use, uh, um, oh gosh, what are they, um, glossaries. You'll forgive my 60-year-old brain. We encourage our instructors to use glossaries in their class. But we did find out when we copy courses from one semester to the next, a glossary is linked to the user, not to the course for some reason. And we never copy user uh, materials from one semester to the next. So what I tell instructors to do, download the glossary to their desktop, and then save it back in the course as a hidden file. Then when we copy the course over, the glossary is there. All they have to do is re-import it back into the course. Makes it really easy to keep up with that glossary. At any rate, I'll do a similar sort of thing with notes to myself. In fact, as the class is progressing, if something happens during class and I want to make a note to myself, gosh, we need to fix this for next semester, very often I'll put that in the form of a hidden label. I'll just leave it there. After we copy the class next semester, I look at that label and I say, oh gosh, that's right. I meant to change this assignment. I can then delete the label, go in and change the assignment, and everybody's happy. So I do use this concept of hidden forms, hidden glossaries, hidden whatever, uh, to help myself move from semester to semester. All right. Um, store messages, great. Um, entries are user data. Uh, I'm talking to myself. Here it's another uh, occupational hazard when you've been on the platform for very many years with notes to self, and it's very handy. Yeah, all of those things are great ideas. Okay, the next uh, concept for the conduct phase is to enhance communication. I've already mentioned email messages I send out. Uh, I use the Moodle messaging system uh, to send notes to students. I tell my students, contact me by Skype or blogs or Facebook. In fact, in my syllabus, and I wanted to pull up a quick copy of my syllabus here. And uh, uh, again, I'm posting now my sample syllabus. You'll notice here in the instructor block in my syllabus, I include uh, even, uh, uh, here's my personal phone number. And I will tell you a, a tip. I'm using a Google 
uh, number here. I have the Google Voice. You can get one as well. And this is my Google Voice number. I have the Google Voice number actually forwarded to my true cell phone. But I figure I really don't want to give students my cell phone number. Goodness knows what that could lead to. I don't mind giving them a Google Voice number. And then if there's a real problem, I can always just get rid of the Google Voice account and create a new one. At any rate, I give the students lots and lots of opportunities here to contact me. And I think that's important that our students have lots of ways to communicate with the instructor, including even old-fashioned telephone service. All right, let me see here. Again, I'm reading the uh, the comments. Uh, Google Voice will not. Oh, it's not available in New Zealand. Uh, and, and I'm really sorry. You might uh, you might try uh, a Skype. Uh, you can create all kinds of Skype uh, Skype in numbers. Now there is a fee for that service. Uh, for me, it's five dollars a month. I do use Skype in. And uh, you can create as many Skype in numbers as you want, and students can use that. And again, if you don't like that, then you can, or if, if there's a problem that comes up, you can always get rid of that Skype in number, change it to something else. So there's a, maybe a possibility through Skype that you can get, um, you can get the same type of service as, uh, as uh, I can get with Google. And I apologize, I, I never mean to present something that's, that's, uh, so localized that it's not available everywhere. I didn't realize that Google Voice was uh, only available in the United States. Um, but again, Skype may be an option uh, for those folks who are not in the United States. Okay. Oh, yeah, they tell us it's coming. Yeah, right, checks in the mail. I've been down that road before. Okay, the next tip for the conduct phase is discussion boards. Uh, post frequently, use Socratic methods to shape the discussion. Provide a discussion wrap up and use audio or video posts. Uh, you can uh, do audio and video posts within Moodle um, if you have uh, a, a good uh, audio uh, a service available or a video service, a streaming service available. I've got to tell you, I do have a personal heartburn with discussion boards. Not with discussion boards per se. They're a great way for students to have discussions in the classroom. I have far, far too many instructors who let discussion boards run themselves. They think it's great pedagogy to post a question and then let the students discuss it. And then at the end of the week, they come in and post some kind of a wrap-up. And I've even had instructors tell me that the problem with discussion boards is as soon as the instructor posts something, the students think that's the honest truth and that ends the discussion because then you start getting groupthink around whatever the instructor wrote. And I like to tell them hogwash. In a classroom, in a physical face-to-face -face classroom setting, as an instructor, I know how to lead a discussion. I ask questions. I, I encourage students to voice their opinions. I elicit feedback from students. I don't just tell them, here's the answer and move on. And we can do exactly the same thing in an online environment. Unfortunately, it's too often a really hard sell for instructors. They just don't get the idea of asking questions and eliciting feedback rather than telling the answer to some question. Anyway. Um, Rich is pointing out that we do have to have uh, moderation to make sure bullying is not happening, and that is correct. As instructors, we have to be uh, present in those places in order to make sure bullying is not taking place. Um, let's see. Uh, and I see Poodle link there. And I must have, oh, Poodle for audio video posting to Moodle. And that's right. In fact, I remember Poodle being presented at a an iMoot, maybe I was at a, a year ago, a couple of years ago. And it's such a cool name for a product. I said, man, I've got to go check this out. And they do have a wonderful service. And uh, I would recommend go out and at least take a look at Poodle and see what they have to offer. Um, okay. Well, I guess I'm done with discussion boards. Uh, they they are a problem, you know. I've got to tell you, uh, one thing that I I had never imagined. Somebody posted and said that discussion boards need to be moderated. Let me give you the worst horror story I've ever heard from an online class. 
Thank goodness it was not my class. This was a class that was at a, another university, and I heard someone tell me about this. Apparently, one day, the... Um, FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, our federal police here in the United States, uh, actually went to some college and confiscate, confiscated a bunch of computers at that college because what they found out was happening was students had signed up for the same class, students in different uh, jurisdictions in, in the United States and overseas and in several different countries, had all agreed they were going to sign up for a particular class. They had also agreed somehow through email or however they worked this out that they were going to use a particular forum in that class to pass photographs of uh, uh, pedophilia, kitty porn, children pornography, using that particular forum as their vehicle to exchange these images. The instructor hadn't bothered to check the doggone forum, and it went on for several weeks, I guess, before finally somebody complained, and then the police went in there and shut the whole class down. Now, i got to tell you, that's just horrifying for me as an administrator. But if you're not moderating your, your forums, that exact type of thing could certainly happen. <sighs> anyway, um, oh, yeah, yeah, that was a crazy situation. I've always remembered that as the worst thing that I can imagine ever happening. Anyway, my next conduct phase practice, a timely responses. And this goes along with the discussion we were having about forums just now. Answer your email within 24 hours. I tell my instructors you have to grade simple assignments within 48 hours. If it's a complex, you know, a 20 page uh, term paper of some sort, well, all right, take several days to grade that. Everyone understands that. But the single most common complaint I get as the administrator of my college's program here, the single most common complaint is the instructor's not answering email, the instructor's not grading work. I turned in this paper, you know, two weeks ago, and I still don't have any feedback on it. And it really just drives me crazy. I go out there and I ask instructors what's going on, and the answer always is, oh, well, I got a little behind. Well, yeah, we're paying you to keep up. And so as instructors, we really have to be careful to keep up with our students answer their email, work with their assignments, uh, do the grading as quickly as you can. <laughs> we get paid here some. It isn't much, but it's a pay. Uh, if you want to teach for me, I, I do offer pay, uh, you know, a dollar a week or something. Um, let me see. Oh, email answer within 24 hours. I will tell you one other tip that I give to my instructors. I like to tell them, if you're going to do a quiz as part of your class, please don't put essay questions in that quiz. And I'll tell you why. If your quiz is all objective style, uh, fill in a, uh, not fill in a blank, true, false, and, and multiple choice, then it's graded by Moodle. The students get their response immediately. And they know immediately how they did with their quiz. Now, before anyone jumps on me about pedagogy and, oh, my goodness, you have to have this, this free flow in order to know if the students really know the material, I agree with that. But if you want students to answer essays, then post that in the form of an assignment. Let the students fill out a, a half a page document or a five page document or whatever you want to do. When students submit an assignment, they really don't expect that assignment to be graded instantly. But when they complete a quiz in class, if that quiz has just one essay question, then the students have to wait for the instructor to come back in and grade that question before they know how well they did on it. So I tell instructors, make your quizzes two parts. Part one is the objective part that students get a grade on immediately. Part two, that's the subjective part that if it takes the professor two or three days to respond, it's not quite so critical to the students. <laughs> yeah, I asked my teachers to work outside their hours. Okay. And again, yeah, if your quiz is formative or summative, it does make a bit of difference. And I understand that. Um, which is manual marked essay, short answer, good workaround. 
you know, I've been at this business a day or two. Uh, kind of, my daddy used to tell me even a blind sow finds an acorn every so often, and I sometimes feel like I've actually found an acorn every so often. Next, office hours. Now, at our college, our full-time faculty members are required to have office hours, uh, a specific hour, and I forget what it is, a couple of hours a week, when they will be available to students in their office. The adjunct faculty, those folks that, that we hire to part-time to just teach a class and do nothing else, of course, are not required to have office hours. I certainly could not force them to do that. But I do encourage them to find a time every week or even every other week when you will make yourself available to students. Tell students, look, here's my Skype number, or, or I've created some kind of a forum in Moodle or a chat room, and I promise I'll be there next Tuesday night at 6 o'clock uh, Arizona time. However you want to set it up, try to find a time when you're, you can work with your students and interact with them live. Now, to be honest with you, even though I've done that every class that I've taught, it's very rare that a student will come in and ask a question. They really just don't want to do that. But I always feel like if I've made the offer, then at least students know that I'm present and I care. And that goes a long way anyway. Office hours, my next practice, monitor students' progress. Uh, you should be in those Moodle tools looking at the student progress every week. Make sure your students are logging in. Make sure they're making progress on the course. And of course, if they're not, contact them. Find out what's going on with them. If they've fallen behind, is there anything I can do to help you catch up? This is just good classroom uh, management practice. But it also lets the students know that you care. Oh, I don't want to get too sappy on this thing. But really, the whole thing is I love students, and I love students to be successful. And so I'll check up on them every week, make sure that they're uh, submitting their assignments. And if they're not, I love them so much, I'm going to write to them and say, hey, what can I do to help you get caught up? Don't get too far behind, because it really is hard in an online class to get caught up. Um, yeah, give me the answer. Do not make me think. It, that's all too often true. Um, so having an extra window open is easy, and it is. Uh, practice 14. Now, I've repeated this practice from an earlier slide to use feedback to give students an opportunity to give you feedback during class. And I understand our College, just like your university, I'm sure, at the end of the semester, institutional research sends out some survey they want students to respond to, and that's nice. And I tell students, please do respond. And I get information back from institutional research, just like you do six weeks later. But I like to post something in the class. And when students bother to send me feedback, I will send them back a response. Now, I will tell you the feedback that I set up in my class, I'm very open with students, and I tell them right up front, I'm going to collect your name with this feedback. And I tell them, at the end of the semester, you'll have a chance to submit anonymous feedback if you really want to tell me something anonymously. That will happen at the end of the semester. You'll get an official note from our college president. You can go out and do that. But during class, I tell them the purpose of this feedback is to help me improve the class. And if you've got a suggestion, I want to know your name so I can email you and engage in a dialogue in, and so that you and I can together help make my class better. And certainly, if a student takes the time to send me feedback, then I'm going to respond. I'll email them. I may change something in class. Or if I don't, at least I'll tell the student why I'm not going to change it. A lot of times, I can't change anything in this particular class because we've already got tests in there, and, and I don't want to change things up for students. But I'll let the student know, man, that's a great idea. I'm going to engage that, or I will start doing that next semester. I just can't change things this semester. And students understand that. At any rate, I'm going to use feedback. And then follow up on promises. I don't often make promises to students. I found that it's sometimes counterproductive. But when I do, I will follow up on those promises. If I promise a student that 
oh, I don't know, at the end of the semester, I'm going to give everybody uh, an extra credit assignment for some reason. I'll follow up on that, and I'll, I will make sure that I do that. That gets me down to my last slide. Before I go finish up, let me go back to my sample course. I do have one last session out here, version 7 of my class. Oh, in fact, you know, let me do this. Let me go back now to version 1. Let's, let's go all the way back to the beginning. And I'll show you this is what it looked like. And as sad as this is, far too many of my professors display this kind of session and think it's good. I will tell you, I'm the, the, the director of our virtual campus, and one of my jobs is to check classes, and I do check classes. And when I run across this sort of thing, I send the instructor a very stern email, and I say, look, we've got to fix this. Call me. Let my staff help you, and we're going to make your class more better. And they will. Generally speaking, instructors really want to make their classes better. They just don't know what to do. So starting with this, I'm going to go on down to version 7 now that incorporates all of the tips that I've covered over the last hour. Uh, we've got some nice things up here that I've written. This is up my personal introduction. We've got some nice, interesting videos here, some graphics. I've organized my material in a way that's easy for students to see and understand. I've got my uh, quick check here so students can send me some feedback. This now becomes a class that to me is inviting to students, and it, it has a very definite instructor presence. Whew. I believe that I've talked enough. The author Mark Twain one time observed, it's a terrible death to be talked to death. And I fear that you folks are getting mighty close to the edge. So I'm going to shut up now and give you a chance to engage in, in a little question and answer session. I'm going to be the typical professor now and not answer any questions, but I'll let you engage with each other. <laughs> no, I won't do that. Let's see here. What do we have? Oh, I don't have enough time. Uh, Teresa, I do get that excuse a lot. And... I don't want to be mean, but when I get that kind of excuse from a professor, I just say, look, I know we're not paying you a lot. I know that. And I'm not asking a lot. I've got an instructional designer who will help you, who will do a lot of the work. But really, you have to earn your paycheck. I am paying you for at least a few hours of your work every week. You've got to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a student, uh, the student who who has taken you know three hours to tell me why they didn't have enough time to do an assignment. You really, it, it's hard to make them understand. It would have been faster just to do the doggone work. Um, who forwarded to me, help desk, I sent him the answer, and he told me he doesn't have time to review the document with the answer to his question. Of course not. Let me tell you one tip that I found really is effective with instructors. When they send me a question where they've asked a question about Moodle, and especially a technical thing, how do I, whatever, create an assignment? At one time, I was typing up a big, long answer with screenshots and send to them. But I found out it's so much faster for me to turn on a screen capture video tool. Uh, I like to use something called Screencast-O-Matic. It's a free thing. You can do it. I, I'll use that. Uh, the Screencast-O-Matic permits me to put a little picture-in-picture -picture, uh, uh, image of myself down in the corner of the screen. So I always turn myself on so instructors feel like that I am personally talking to them. I'll then go through. I'll do the screen capture. Uh, again, according to my own um, standards, that video will never be more than four minutes long, five minutes long at the outside. But I'll actually go through and I'll show them exactly how to do what it is they've asked me to do. I then uh, I'll upload that. I'll create a link to the upload file. I send that link to the instructor and I say, hey, 
your question was really good. I'm really glad you asked it. In fact, it was so good I wanted to do a quick video to show you uh, how to how to fix this in your class. And the video's only three minutes and 37 seconds long. Here's a link. Uh, let me know if I can do anything else to help you. And I found in general that faculty really respond well to getting a video from me. Of course, the ulterior motive here is if they see a video from me as being effective, maybe at some point they'll think, well, a video from me, the instructor, will also be effective. Yeah, it's a dream of mine anyway. Oh, that's very cunning, George. That's very cunning indeed. <laughs> Um, well, I just want to say thank you very much for your presentation. I do not think you talked us to death. I think we had some really great conversation in the chat, and um, it, I found it very useful, and I'm sure others did too. So, thank you. Teresa, um, there, there is a question here I do want to answer quickly. Someone asked, do I uh, archive those videos in a fact? Uh, some of them I do. I will tell you occasionally uh, the video that I create has to have student data in there. An instructor is asking specifically something that's going on with his grade book. Well, because that's privacy information, I post that video in such a way that it's private only between myself and the instructor. And of course, that can never be released to the public. But if I have a video that can be released, if it's something I've done on my development server where it's just fake student data, then certainly I gather those up. I uh, create a, a, a list of links to those facts, and I post that in our faculty resource center uh, so that faculty can make use of it later. That's okay. a really good Thanks, idea. Teresa. And that's okay. Oh, look, we've got 40 minutes until the next session, so there's no problems with sticking around and continuing with questions. But I do just want to say thanks very much. And I think also there's lots of videos online. Um, so if there's something that that you can point to an existing video, then you can actually um, you know do that as well. So thanks again, George. And everyone, don't forget that in the course is a link to the um, demo site that George has been demonstrating today, as well as a slide. So feel free to keep asking questions. Um, unmute your microphone if you want to let us hear your voice, or let us know in the chat if you need that. Um, to happen, and yeah, George, it's up to you how, how long you stay here to answer questions. Thank I'll you. Stick around uh, for a bit. And I'm, I'm going to say that we have exactly the same issue with our instructors that I see here in the chat room. Um, I've created a ton of help videos and, and uh, lessons that I've posted out in the uh, Faculty Resource Center, and it simply isn't used, and I know that. Um, in the end, I feel like my most effective uh, work with our instructors is hold their hand, call them on the phone, and step them through one step at a time. And bless their hearts, sometimes that works really well, sometimes not so well. But it's the only thing I've found that I can pretty much guarantee will be, at least the instructors will listen. Uh, so that's a problem for me as well. I, I wish I had a magic bullet that, that I fixed all of that. I just don't have that. Oh, no, Rich, I have a wonderful staff here. Um, I have uh, five people in my staff. All five of us are equally competent with Moodle. Um, each of us have our own uh, specific uh, strength. My strength is, is dealing with tests, uploading quizzes, uh, uh, quiz questions and such. And so if one of my other staffers get a question about testing, uh, they'll always refer that to me. So we all have our little strengths, but all of us are good enough with Moodle. We can answer 99% of the instructor questions that come in. I don't want anyone to think that George is running a one-person show here. I've got a great staff, and they support me and my, my uh, faculty very nicely. Yeah, yeah, I feel pretty fortunate here. I go to a lot of conferences, and I talk to people who are running one one person staff or two person staff. I feel very confident that I've got five people on my staff. Uh, how many academics do we have? Um, and that's a really good question. Uh, we run about, oh, I suppose, 300 classes or so every semester. Um, and all of those are college credit classes, about 300 of them a semester. Uh, and we run a 16-week semester, two semesters per year, plus a short summer term. 
Um, I have about seven, no, I'm, I'm sorry, about a hundred instructors, a part-time instructors, adjunct faculty, who teach those classes. And we have about, oh, I'm going to guess 20 full-time faculty members at the college who will teach one or two online classes as part of their base load. So that's the size of population I'm talking about. Yeah, we have campuses. We have, um, and, and Randa, uh, we have, um, we service a military installation, so we have students located all around the world. I have faculty members who live all around the world. A lot of them are spouses of military members. Uh, so I have one who lives in uh, Germany. Uh, we have, we used to have one who lived in uh, Japan, but he's come back to the States lately. Uh, we have another one someplace overseas, and it escapes me right now where, where she is. So we do have a few faculty who live um, very distant from where we are now. I will tell you, some of you seem to enjoy the fact that I have ulterior motives. One of my ulterior motives years ago when I first started working with our virtual campus uh, we were constantly getting complaints from the from the permanent faculty members here at the college that we were stealing their students. And my answer was, well, join us online, and then you can have those great students too. Well, in order to try to persuade them to join us online, we began to create an empty course shell for every class that's taught in our district every semester. There's nothing in there except a statement. We use a template. I've got a statement up in session zero that basically says, your instructor is not using Moodle. If you have questions about your class, be sure and ask your instructor during class, something like that. My ulterior motive was enough students would go to their instructor and say, why aren't you putting our grade book in Moodle, that eventually instructors would say, dang, I need to be using this system. I will tell you, though I don't have any direct evidence, I believe that that has been effective. And I have quite a few instructors who 10 years ago were actually Luddites, and today at least post handouts in Moodle for their classes. So something is beginning to break down some barriers there. Folks, thank you. I see folks are leaving, and that's great. Thanks for your time. I do appreciate having you here. I've had a lot of fun with you today.